that they didn't really care for. Right now, thanks to the internet, you can listen to people your age and younger making psychedelic rock music that sounds like it was recorded in 1965. You know what I mean? Like everything is fractured, everything is niche right now, and, and that's what makes today's musical day and age so interesting. I mean, so what if it's if it's like a total ripoff of, of, of this other thing that happened 40 years ago? If it moves you, you know, if it means something to you, you know? And I think something that's like totally gonna happen like 15 years from now is kind of like when I went to high school, there are these kids who, like when I went to school and when I went to high school in the 90s, they were totally like these kids my age who were like, I don't listen to that radio stuff. I listen to classic rock. You know, like my parents turned me on to that. I'm listening to Led Zeppelin. I'm listening to the Beatles. That's real music. You know, like 10, 15 years from now, there's totally gonna be kids like, I don't listen to that new hip hop. I listen to Nas and Biggie and all that other stuff. I'm into the classic stuff, you know, and that's fine, you know, but the thing is, uh, as music changes, people are gonna be attracted to certain kinds of, of music, no matter what kind of uh, era it comes from. And that's what's so awesome about the internet because it makes it easier now to do that. You can go listen to something that came out in 1970 and 1980 and it's as if it kind of came out today. You know, you don't have that, oh, that's something that happened so long ago or that's something I can only hear if I listen to a certain radio station and they don't really play a lot of the music that I like. I only like that one band from that one time period. You know, I mean, you can kind of jump on the internet and just hear whatever and, and really kind of put it here and, and, and now. How long have I gone? All right, so I'm gonna get into quickly something that may be funny for a lot of you. Who is Cal Chuchesta? Does anybody wanna know who Cal Chuchesta is? Get this question a lot. People wanna know the origins of Cal Chuchesta. Okay, origin of Cal Chuchesta in under 30 seconds, no. All right, so Cal Chuchesta kind of started when I kind of went on this binge watching and re-watching the movie American Movie. Has anyone seen that movie? Has anyone seen that film? Wow, nobody has seen American Movie. You've seen American Movie. It's great, it is great. American Movie is like this insane document, uh, uh, <laughs> documentary? Am I saying that right? Documentary, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've had four hours sleep, can you tell? This actually happens in the reviews and I cut it out. Um, is this insane documentary following the exploits of this dude from like the Wisconsin area trying to make this really short film and it's like this horror movie that you end up watching at the end of the movie and it's really bad. And you know, the dude, despite the fact that like the movie he makes is really bad, he's just an insane guy. He's insanely passionate. He has like mom and his friends in the movie. And you know, they all kind of talk with this accent over here, you know, oh, especially his buddy who he went to high school with and he took a little too much drugs and is a little out of his mind because of it. And they're just some really colorful characters. And I remember as a joke at the pizza place where I work, after a friend of mine, were, uh, a friend of mine and I who works with me were kind of fooling around, you know, my boss yelled at us and said, only talk about business. And we're like, all right. So I started talking only about business in that accent. So, so then he started repeating it. And then we would only talk about, we would only talk in that accent, you know, just to like break our boss's balls. And just be like, hey, you know, oh, hey, you got that pizza over there? It looks great. You cook that real good, okay? <laughs> so then we just talk back and forth in that accent and just drive our bosses nuts. So then, you know, also kind of coming from this pizza place, there's a lot of people, there's people from Peru, and there's people from Mexico in there, and there's people from you know, uh, uh, the Eastern Bloc in there, as well as Italians, and there's a lot of like language mixing, and like a lot of people saying each other's languages like uh, incorrectly, and I remember uh, you know, one, one kind of thing that gets thrown around a lot is and, uh, uh which, which the meaning escapes me at the moment, but I think it's just like, you know, what's up? But um, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but anyway, you know, to me that uh, other, someone else mispronounced it as something else and then I remember like, hey, you know, all this like ridiculous shit like kind of sounds like names or something. I remember uh, one thing that my boss always says is Hena Janana Maron where you're kind of taking the Mother Mary's name in vain. And, you know, we just said, what'd you say, John Marone? You know, it's like, who's, who the hell's that? You know, just like breaking balls again. 
And then that other phrase kind of turned into Cal Chuchesta, and we just kind of made ridiculous names after all these phrases that people are always saying, just because we're totally bored and nobody's buying pizza. No, people actually do buy a lot of pizza, but anyway. Um, so then from there, you know, I kind of recently had just hit 222 subscribers on YouTube, and I just thought it was like a ridiculous joke to, you know, do an interview with, with me because I'm so famous now. And, you know, I, ne I needed a character to kind of ask me questions. And then I just kind of came up with the, you know, Cal Chuchesta character to ask me these questions. I got a fake mustache and just thought, how else am I going to make me look different? I don't have, like, a wig or anything. You know, I just put, I don't, I just put on a button-down shirt and then, you know, just kind of did that accent, closed, squinted my eyes, partially because to do the character, I had to take my glasses off. And, uh, you know, just sort of, like, took that to the next level and it just kind of got ridiculous and people were like I love this guy but the thing is like what's so funny is like the character the whole concept of the character and the dynamic of what I do with that character um, is so inspired just like so ingrained into me already because he's so like he's the heifer to my Rocco he is like the Stimpy to my Ren he is like the Daggett to my Norbert, or Norbit, I can't remember his name. Like, I haven't watched Angry Beavers in a while. Um, just like all these Nickelodeon cartoons that like came out from the 90s and the early 2000s. You know, I mean, you guys could say Patrick and SpongeBob as well. Um, you know, it's just like, just come up with this clueless, funny character that, uh, you know, doesn't know anything about anything, constantly mispronouncing everything, and I just kind of always get mad at him. You know, it's like I kind of figured that it, it wouldn't be funny if I didn't get angry, even though I'm not really an a, a extremely angry person. You know, I just figured I, I have to have this guy say something so dumb that it would just, like, annoy you if he was real. You know, and, and people ask me all the time, you know, and it kind of becomes a game like, hey, why are you so mean to Couch Chester? Why can't you be nice to him? You know, just be nice to him. He's, he's funny. He's a lovable guy. You know, but that, you know, kind of also adds to the, to the other joke that I have in my head that it's like everybody hates, you know, a critic. Everybody thinks I'm a critic. You can't like a critic. A critic's a jerk. So I have to be like mean to him. I have to be hateable when it comes to, you know, him. Even though he's dumb, you want to love him and you want to take him home and you want to cuddle him, you know, make him feel okay. And, you know, that sort of seems to be just the rundown of what I do, how I do it, who is Cal Chuchesta, why I do what I do and how I started. So I want to open the floor up for the Q's and the A's. I'm going to answer so many Q's. I'm going to try to give as many A's as possible without looking like an A-hole. What is it? Yeah, yeah. We'll be taking audience questions fr from you guys. I mean, I thought they knew that already. I'll be only answering questions from people who are not you. No, not true. Okay, so I mean, if you raise your hand, we will pass you the mic. Okay, you got a question right there? Uh, mom's right there with stepdad Brian. Right there, hands up. And big man in the back with my stepmom, Marsha. I have to tell them, people ask me all the time, get so many comments that are like, what nationality are you? Are you Asian? You know, it's like one quarter Sicilian, three fourths French Canadian, and that's it. And that's it, I'm not Asian as, as most people think. I don't know, like I even went to a party once and this drunk Asian dude said like, I remember somebody made some stupid Asian joke, and he's like, there's another Asian guy right there. And I'm like, come on. You know, it's like, I, I don't know. It's like, you don't think I look Asian, do you? It's like, I don't look Asian. You know, it's, I don't know. But people just, you know, people who don't have, I guess, a lot of experience with Asian people think I'm Asian or something. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure to Asians I don't look Asian. You know, I, I think. You know, I've never had an Asian person tell me, except that drunk guy. But I think it was mostly because he was drunk. So anyway, next question. <laughs>
Good question. Um, right now, I make money off of AdSense, uh, ads that run on the blog, you know, there's sort of those embedded ads, as well as YouTube. Ads run before the YouTube videos, you kind of get those text ads on the videos. After a certain amount of subscribers on YouTube, and pretty much about any major video website, they will kind of partner you and allow you to start making ad revenue off of those videos. And with every, you know, um, amount, of, well, with every extra view you get, you know, that's sort of more revenue for you. And I am just sort of like kind of approaching the area where I can kind of do this as a full-time job. I mean, right now I could probably scrape by on what I do simply on YouTube, but, you know, I like having, you know, a good amount of groceries at the end of every week. And, um, you know, uh, that's basically the, the how of it. I mean, it's just sort of generating enough subscribers and views on your videos to the point where they want to approach you to monetize that video. Um, there are also, you know, uh, standalone websites where you can kind of host video on there and they'll run ads on it for you. Video is really on the internet kind of a burgeoning business. So many websites, especially music websites out there, are trying to go video. Um, you guys, I'm sure a lot of you who go on Pitchfork have seen Pitchfork kind of revamp Pitchfork TV after stopping it for a while. And that's because people really kind of want to connect with the artists and, and the music that they are listening to on a deeper level. You know, that people in music, you know, especially in today's day and age, are so image oriented. You know, people are so easily persuaded by someone who looks cool, someone who looks sexy, someone who looks nerdy. And because of that, you know, it's like, it's, it's nice to have the video element there. Um, it's definitely a growing thing. I mean, most people right now, if any of you have seen the, the recent radio-oriented video that I put out recently, most people right now are getting a majority of their information still from radio and television. But when you take that demographic down to teenagers and 20-somethings, the internet, as far as at least, you know, getting exposed to new music, it's in like the 60 percentile, it's in the 70 percentile, people using YouTube and using, you know, websites like Spotify and, and stuff like that to find out about new music. And as soon as, you know, all those people older than us go off to a better place, <laughs> you know, you guys will still probably be using the internet to find out about things that are relevant to you. And, you know, just imagine people who are younger than you being even more in tune to the internet, you know, once they have, I don't know, Google brain microchip or whatever that you get installed in your head and, you know, you could just like browse the internet while, you know, goofing off in class or something like that. So that's kind of how I make money right now at the moment. I know where I am, it's gonna be growing. You know, more people are going on YouTube every day to, to look at video content and that's basically how people are stumbling upon what I do because part of the, another part of the reason that I started just talking about music in video is that not only did I see nobody was talking about music in video on the blogosphere, but I also had noticed that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people go on YouTube every day just to stream music. In comparison with Pandora, Spotify, all those music streaming websites that are legal, YouTube's music plays, only the legal music plays though, dwarf their numbers by 10 times. You can combine all their numbers together and YouTube's plays, just the legal plays, the songs that are uploaded on YouTube legally, dwarf all those numbers combined, you know? And there's not really any show of that kind of switching anytime soon because people get so much more access to songs on YouTube that they wouldn't hear anywhere else, you know, even though it's not technically supposed to be that kind of website. Next question. What do I use to get my new music? Good question. Um, I use a bunch of blogs that I have linked on my blog that I read on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Um, as well as, you know, a few websites that I kind of have album listings on. But I also get PR emails sent to me, promos sent to me, but the biggest and greatest source of recommendations and just sort of like, you know, mm, ideas as to what's good and what could be covered is from you guys. When you guys email me and tweet at me and just sort of send me YouTube messages. I mean, that kind of lets me know when something is either really, really, I mean, like really authentically hot and you're interested in that and that's really popular right now because, you know, Stereo Gum and five other blogs that are just as popular can blog about something and, I mean, I'll tell you, it happens all the time, nobody cares, you know? I don't get not one message about it. Sometimes it ends up in something that I actually end up liking and I'm surprised nobody really took to it and sent it to me. But, I mean, you know, 
messages from the people who watch on a day-to-day -day basis are extremely valuable when it comes to you know, knowing what's actually relevant to the people who view. And that's, and that's pretty much how you know, I, I find out about new music. Mm -hmm. And from you know, friends and, and people who are kind of colleagues of mine who I know also run blogs whose tastes I kind of take very seriously. But you know, that's, that's the majority of it. And, and I follow a lot of uh, record labels too. You know, uh, at least like, you know, uh, several dozen record labels, maybe even more, maybe even at least like more than 50, you know, record labels of various genres. Two dudes together. You on the, you first, and then him. <laughs> um. Honestly, I've never been like huge into pinbacks, so my feelings on them reuniting, you know, it's like I can't really say. But it's like I kind of made this video once about how I feel about people reuniting in general. And it's like, you know, there's kind of the tendency to be really like hyped up on it and excited. And, you know, it doesn't always end up as being disappointing, but like, you know, it's, it's good to be excited about your favorite band getting back together. I mean, you know, I'd love to see Neutral Milk Hotel put out a new record, but, you know, I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, but, but me personally about Pinback reuniting, it's like, you know, I even, whether I'm a fan of the band or not, I'm usually pretty, hmm, I'm just going to see where this goes, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, live music is incredibly important because not only did that friend of mine, you know, turn me on to, uh, punk music by just going over to his place, you know, and just kind of like hearing some records and, and stuff like that. But, you know, when I was much younger in my teen years, and I was, you know, telling these guys over here over, uh, over dinner that in Waterbury, you know, there were quite a few shows going on in VFWs at the time. And I'm sure a lot of you guys maybe have gone to like Manic production shows. I mean, you know, Mark is like the, Mark, Manic Mark is the same age as me. And it's like, you know, when he was booking shows, I was kind of growing up going to a lot of his shows. He'd book a lot of hardcore and punk shows over at the VFW in Wallingford. But in Waterbury, you know, kids from Woolkid and Prospect and, and Waterbury too would kind of like, you know, book some bands that were in their high school and just kind of like charge five bucks at the door. And then, you know, you'd see some people who bought amps down at Sam Ash turn them all the way up and just go, Wah! you know, at the time, Hate Breed was pretty big. So there were a lot of bands copying that metalcore sound. And, um, you know, some, like, screamo core bands and, and stuff like that. A few bands that were, like, copying Tool, you know, th things of that nature. I mean, not a lot of just, like, hardcore punk. I mean, I, I think I saw a few bands like that at those VFWs. But, you know, I was going mostly to metal shows and just sort of, like, being able to kind of see the camaraderie around music in person and see people moshing and having fun. I mean, that's always great. I mean, you know, being a fan of a record or even hating a record can always be enhanced or your mind can totally be changed by seeing a live show. But I mean, you know, just live music in general, especially in an age where so many people are just like listening to tunes off of their iPod and off of their laptop speakers, being able to go to a show and like actually feel, you know, the physical sound hitting you and, you know, everybody around you enjoying it at the same time can be a really extremely fun thing, like an entirely new experience and, and viewing the music in a completely different light. So I mean, live music is immensely important and it's something that I urge that, that you guys make sure you support the best that you can, even though we're in an age where uh, record sales are kind of on, on the decline thanks to pirating and just the sheer number of artists out there right now kind of giving each other competition. Mom, <laughs> mom has a question. Okay. Um, no, I have no clue. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, uh, right now I'm at the point where like, you know, once in a while I will get an email from somebody who works at a PR firm who are promoting a band who are like, hey, you gonna review that album? You know, whereas before they didn't really care. Um, so I, I guess I have some kind of impact. You know, once in a while an artist will come to me and say, hey, that album review you did for me two years ago, like I still get traffic from that. You know, or, you know, people still bring that up to me. I mean, it's like, you know, you could put something on the internet now and still three years later, people could be seeing an impact. I mean, after Danny Brown talked about me in that ASAP Rocky interview that him and ASAP Rocky did, I still get comments today that are like, yo, Danny Brown shouted you out. 
and you know, you have to be nice. You know, you can't be like, I saw that dickhead. You know, it's like, I saw that. That was funny. You know, that was for the hundredth time. But it's like, you know, but I, but I mean, you know, I understand the excitement when the first time I saw it, I was like, what? 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 No way. But yeah, hopefully, I, I got invited to see him over here. So, you know, may, maybe get the chance to, to see his, you know, missing tooth in person. I just kind of hear that fiery flow and see that crazy hair. But, um, but yeah, mom, totally cannot, I, I don't know if I'm selling a lot of albums or anything like that right now. So just, just. As far as fixing pirating and everything like that, I mean, things have definitely moved in an interesting direction. I mean, when I was younger, if you wanted to hear music, you had to pay. If you wanted to hear it, you had to pay for it. And people who are older than me as well, unless you went over to a friend's house to listen to it. Now, listening is free. Listening is completely free. I mean, you could listen wherever. There are tons of websites right now where you don't even need to pirate, and you can just stream it online and just listen at your leisure. Owning it is what costs money. You know, and if you don't like it, well, then of course you don't buy it. I mean, back when listening is what costed money, um, you had to buy it and then find out after whether or not you liked it and then try to get four bucks for it down at the strawberries or the FYE. <laughs> you know, um, because they're not going to sell it back to you at a good price. No, they are not. So, you know, that was kind of your options. And, and right now, especially given that you can go on the internet, I mean, you, anybody, like, can go on the internet put up an album, and they want that album to be heard. I mean, you know, they don't have a record label behind them. They want people to hear the music. You know, they, they think that their music's great, and it has, you know, just as much merit as anybody else's music. The best and, and easiest way to, you know, kind of let people hear your music is just to let them stream it, just to let them download it, just give it away for free if you want people to listen to it and, and share it. And because of that, I mean, even though we personally perceive some music to be better than others, you know, or better than other music, and because of that we perceive the music we like to have more value, it's kind of brought down the overall value of music, you know, entirely, because there's just so much competition out there. You know, it, imagine if there were as many, you know, uh, uh, aspirin companies out there as there are, you know, bands and rappers and electronic music producers. I mean, you'd be paying a cent for a bottle, you know, but it's, that's not the case, you know, and, and the thing is, like, it doesn't even make sense to, you know, charge that price for aspirin because it costs so much more to make, you know. It's like there's a certain level of competition in that industry that there can be, you know. In music, there's, like, unlimited because it all just comes from you, you know. As long as you have the instruments and the passion to make the music, it's pretty much free to make, you know. Um, so because of that, just the mere plethora of everything out there, um, even music that we think is great, you know, the overall value has gone down. Because the fact that you can go on the internet and search up music of every genre and every style, you could find way more albums today that you think are amazing that you could have found 15 to 20 years ago, you know, because your resources to find out about them would have been limited to the radio, TV, music magazines, and things like that. Yes. Um, what do I see that's changing in independent music? I mean, the biggest thing to me that, that is changing in like independent music is just style, what people prefer. You know, I mean, I remember when I was in college and I was listening to a lot of, you know, indie bands, just at that time, indie had become like a style, like a sound. It became sort of like Arcade Fire and Death Cab for Cutie and Modest Mouse and stuff like that. Whereas beforehand, independent music just meant you were on an independent label or unsigned. It didn't mean you had a certain sound. It didn't mean you sounded a certain way, you know? And now I feel like things like indie folk and, you know, indie rock, and, and things of that nature, things that would have been just like huge back when, when I was going to college are just, you know, slightly less interesting to, to, to a lot of new music listeners now. You know, things more like, I don't know, it's not a genre, but like swag rap, you know, and like dubstep, 
you know, that stuff is hot right now. Even though dubstep was around when I was in college and, you know, I thought it was okay, but now dudes like James Blake and Skrillex have kind of like reinvented it into something that sounded way different than it did in 2001. And now it's sort of like hot all of a sudden. So it's like, you know, a trend can come out of nowhere, you know, something that's been around for 10 years or more, you know? So to me, I mean, all those things that I just said about the price of music, that's definitely a huge, huge change. The amount of musicians and bands out there, also a huge change. But just trends, you know, are ever changing. And if there is another huge change that I should note, it's that the internet has definitely accelerated the speed at which things go out of style. I mean, you know, who's still listening to their Chill Wave albums? Anybody still listen to their Chill Wave? Anybody still pop that washed out on every <laughs> once in a while? You listen to that Loma Prieta shit and you're like, <laughs> And then you're like, <sighs> like, then you just vibe out like that. Okay, all right. <laughs> we're gonna take a few. We're take a few Twitter questions. Okay, so this is from Twitter user use. Uh, Y-U-S, and then his at handle is use, not use. Okay. And uh, he says, do gimmicks have a place in music? I'm oh, talking about bands, band names like Young Magic, Grime Shoulder Mic Stand, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, man. Like, gimmicks have a huge place in music. And the thing is, gimmicks, though people react to the word gimmick badly, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, a bunch of dudes getting together and spitting on these kind of like beats that, that sample karate movies and spitting about like doing sword shit isn't a gimmick. You know, of course it's a gimmick. Of course it's a concept, but that doesn't mean it's bad. That can make an album funny. That can make an album entertaining. I mean, the issue comes into play when you basically have a gimmick, but you don't really have the music or you don't really have the foresight or you don't really have, you know, um, an idea or a concept outside of the gimmick. You do the one thing and that's the one thing that you do. And the thing is, you know, a gimmick can be really great for an album, you know, or it can be really great to start out with. But as soon as you put out that second, that third album, especially in the internet age where people get tired of shit fast, you know, people are really quick to be like, you know, whatever. You know, I've heard this already. You know, I've heard the gimmick. It was fun two years ago, but I kind of want something else new now. You know, just like I was saying with that chill wave thing, you know, lo-fi kind of came and went. I remember when waves blew up, like I was getting 30 emails in my inbox today, like, we're a lo-fi band. We're a lo-fi band. We play lo-fi. And it's like, of course you do. You were playing lo-fi before waves blew up too. You, like you record like really badly, but now it's sort of like, <laughs> now it's in fashion to be recording really badly. And there's still a lot of good, badly recorded music out there. You know, it's just that you have to have more than being lo-fi, you know, to be good. You have to be more than a C-punk, my friend, you know? <laughs> Yeah, let's do another Twitter. Just one more. Let's do one more. Okay. Uh, sh anybody here go on Mu? I hate saying Mu. I like saying Mu. I've been going on there since 2006. I've only called it Mu. Oh, they're called mutants or muffins or muchachos. Anybody go on Mu? Bam, 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 bam. You filthy animals. Um, <laughs> there's this music board that is on the website 4chan. It's uh, called MU. I call it MU. It's the letters MU. That's why I call it that. I don't care, MU. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably going to leave some nasty comments on my videos or thumb them down or like hack my YouTube account and just like put pictures of kittens being destroyed or something. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, this music board that I've been frequenting for a very long time, I remember like, oh, this music board is so funny, man. It's like, I should try to make a joke that people will repeat all the time and it'll be funny, you know, and be this, make a meme that everybody will think is cool on this board. Then, then I'll be the cool guy. And then I remember for a while I didn't go on there and then it's like I ended up being that joke on the board. So it's like, you know, so now pictures are comp always like, you know, re like pictures of me like this. You know, like uh, all over the board, pictures of Calchuchesta, you know, Count Cheska, like all these memes, all these jokes. And it's like, you know, hey, you know, it's like, hey, what'd you think of that album? Oh, it's such a light three, you know, or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's funny how people can kind of take something you make and then just kind of